through uh, some tough times in life, it's hard to stop and say, oh, and by the way, thank you for this. You know, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard when you're going through the struggles to say thank you, but to know that God's working that together to make you stronger and he's working it together for your good. Um, you, can, you can say thank you even while you're going through it, but a lot of times we get focused on what we're going through more than we're focused on the one who's going through it with us. So remember, it was a powerful song. I love that song. Uh, if we could thank him when we're going through it, rather than after we see how it all worked out, we'd be better for it. I don't know what's going on, God, but I thank you for the scars. I thank you for forming them. I thank you for what, you, what you're giving me. You know, throughout 2019, God has blessed our church on many, many levels. Looking back over the year, we saw several people get saved and baptized. We saw many new faces. And we made many new friends in 2019. We have old friends that have come back and connected to our church from years past. God has been very good to us. He has blessed us. Our church is very healthy, and most importantly, we're growing deeper and we're growing spiritually. And that's the growth that you're looking for in any church, whether it's a church of 7,000 or a church of three people. What you're looking for in a church, the growth that you're looking for is spiritual growth. Because if you have growth on every other, other level, but you're missing that, then you're missing everything. So God's been good to us. We're growing deeper. We're growing spiritually. And even in our individual lives, we can all look back over 2019 and see that God remained faithful all the way through. And he continued to bless. Even if you're going through a rough time right now, looking back over the year, you can say, you know what? God has been faithful. He's been true all the way through. He's been good and he's continued to bless my life. Now we're in the beginning of 2020. We're made it to another decade. Um, and I want to see our church come together with a vision for this year. Last year had its ups and downs for every single one of us. And we all had a time in, in last year where we might have felt like we needed to rob Peter to pay Paul to make ends meet. You know, we've, we all go through those times. So I figured that this year we should just cut to the chase and go find out what both Peter and Paul have and get it early. I figured that's a good way to start. So this morning I would like to take a look at both Peter and Paul and see what they have to offer. And I want us to take what they have. Uh, I want us to do it because after all, I think that's what they would really want for us anyway. You know, let's, let's go ahead and find out what Peter and Paul have and let's go take it. Because, you know, like in, throughout 2019, we felt like we were there at some point or another I'm going to have to rob Peter to pay Paul in this situation. So let's not waste any time in 2020. Let's just go right to the chase and let's go ahead and find out what they have and let's get it. That way we don't have to worry about doing that anymore throughout 2020. Let's just go ahead and do it. So first of all, I would like to uh, take a look at Peter. Let's go ahead and remember he's the one we're taking from anyway. We want to take from Peter. So let's go to him first. In Acts chapter 3, we have this story where Peter and John are, are moving together and Peter has something to offer and he has something he can offer. But let's look at this in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. So Peter and John have just had a huge part in starting the church back in Acts chapter 2. If you look back at chapter, you see the church taking off. They have a huge part in this. Now they're heading into the temple in, in uh, chapter 3 when they pass by a man who's been crippled for his entire life. Now, I'd like to give us all an idea of the current events surrounding this story. Let's give a little bit of background here. Less than two months before this event in Acts chapter 3 happens, Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. Just prior to this. And within the last couple weeks before this happened, Jesus ascended back up to heaven. So this is all current events that are going on here. Now two of his Jesus' fishermen disciple are on their way into the temple when they run by this man and they see him crippled. And they see him, he's in need of help and he's asking for people to give them, to give him their money because that's the only livelihood this guy has. And believe it or not, I know this is going to be shocking to you because it was shocking to me, Peter is the one who opens his mouth up first. 
So when we look at this story, Peter's the first one to speak, which if you look at Peter's story all the way through, he's always the first one to speak. He always has something to say. So let's look at this. Verse 4 of Acts chapter 3. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Peter, as usual, draws attention to himself. But this time he's actually doing it in order to draw attention to Christ. Peter's learned a lot through his life. Through his walk with Jesus Christ, he's learned a lot of stuff. And now at this point, he's still attracting people. He's still drawing attention to himself. But this time, he's drawing attention to himself to make sure that they notice Christ. He's learned a lot. He's grown up a lot. This lame man is in need of other people's generosity in order to help him survive. That's, that's his scenario. That's his situation. He needs other people to help him. And when Peter tells him to look at him, his hopes are that Peter and John are going to give him some money. So Peter goes ahead and he crushes that dream immediately. This man is like, okay, they, hey, look at us. I'm hoping for something. Give me some money. And Peter, just the first thing Peter says is, hey, by the way, we're broke. We don't have anything. We don't have anything. Look at... Uh, Look at verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. This guy just received what Peter has, and he has no intention of going to Paul to pay Paul. Okay, He just got what Peter had. But the question is, what did Peter give him? You ever think about that in this story? What did Peter give him? I have the ability to walk, so I'm giving you the ability to walk. No. That's, there's something more to this. I'm not giving you riches. I'm not leading you to the Lord. I'm, you're, the, the man doesn't stop and say, how do I be saved or anything like that. So what is Peter actually giving to this guy? Peter said, what I do have, I give you. So what he did have was question mark. What did he have to give and what did this man actually receive from him? This man has never been able to walk and now he has full ability to walk. Peter wasn't offering him just the ability to walk. That's not what, that's not this story. Peter's not just saying, hey, I have the ability to walk, so let me give that to you. How do you give that to somebody, by the way? How do you, how do you just do that? You know, I have the ability to walk, so why don't, you, why don't you get up and walk with me? It doesn't, you can't give that. So Peter says, what I have, I give you. And this man ends up receiving whatever that is. He was offering him the opportunity to advertise Christ in a brand new way. That is what this guy is being offered. He's not being offered the ability to walk, even though he did receive that. Peter's going a whole lot deeper here. I want to give you what I do have. And the chapter seems to indicate that this man already had faith, because, uh, but he was also lame. He, he already has faith. You can tell this guy is already a believer, but he is lame. And Peter's about to advertise Christ with both of these things. Look at verse 8. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 8 tells us how he gets up. Why does it matter how he gets up? Well, it mentions it here. It doesn't say that he tested out his new functioning legs. He didn't put a little weight on this foot and, okay, that one, I can feel that one. Let me try the other one and put some weight on that foot. No, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. It says that he jumped up and then he goes straight into the temple praising God. That's, that's what's going on here. I'm not, I'm not going to test these legs out to see if they work. No, he just jumps up. He jumps up and he goes into the temple and he praises God. It doesn't say that he asked Peter how it was that he was able to walk. How in the world does this work? I've never, I don't even, it says that it was his life. He's never walked before. Now he's walking for the first time and he doesn't take that, you know, his mom's not standing there, look at he's taking his first step. No, he's jumping. 
He's jumping and running. That's, that's what this guy is doing. And it, he, do, it, he doesn't stop and say, how does, this, how does this work? How did I get this feeling in my legs? He does, it doesn't even say that he stops to say thank you. It says that he run, gets up, he leaps, he goes into the temple and he starts praising God. That's what he's got going on. He knew who deserved the credit. He didn't stop and talk to Peter and John. He didn't talk amongst the crowd that was near him. No, he knew who got the credit. So he jumped up, went into the temple, and praised God for what God just did for him. But this wasn't the entire reason for his healing. The miracle was about to bring the events of the last couple months back to the forefront. Remember what just happened in the last couple months? Jesus was crucified. He rises from the dead. He just ascended back up to heaven just prior to this event. All of this that's happening this day is to bring everything that has just happened previously to the forefront so people could see this again. Look at verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch which was, is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. I want to point out that this man wasn't about to let Peter and John get away. He's holding on to them. He wanted to remain with Peter and John. I, I want to stay with you guys. He's holding on to them and then the crowd begins to come towards them in amazement at what they're seeing. Guess who's walking? The guy that we have to carry to the temple all the time so he can get some money to live on. That guy that we've been carrying for all these years, he's up walking. And they're completely amazed at what they're seeing. Look at verse 12. So when Peter saw it, again, he's going to talk, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our power or godliness we made this man walk? Peter immediately discredits himself and John as the ones who are able to make this man whole. Like, what are you so amazed about? Also, do you really think that these two fishermen here <laughs> had what it took to get that done? That we don't have that kind of power. He discredits himself immediately. Now, the old Peter might have, said, might have straightened his tie out a little bit and, you know... Stuck his chest out of Yeah, we just did that. But this Peter has learned a lot. This guy has grown in his relationship with Christ. He calls attention to himself to give attention to Christ. And then when this man gets up and he doesn't just get up and walk, but he's jumping around praising God, everybody comes in and Peter says, do you really think these two fishermen here had what it took to get that done? We don't have that kind of power. He admits that it was done by someone powerful, but it wasn't the power that they had that made this guy whole. These people were definitely curious about how this could have happened, so Peter decides to spill the beans. You want to know who did it? I'm going to let you know who did it. Look at verse 13. It says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now that would have been an eerie wake-up call. You want to know who healed this man? Let's go back a couple weeks. Let's go back a few weeks. Let's see if you can remember this. You remember Jesus? It's still in the news today. You know what just happened within the last couple months? Let's talk about Jesus. You remember several weeks ago how you killed the only begotten Son of God? What, an, what a great introduction. Like, you want to know who healed him? Let me tell you who healed him. You remember when you killed God's only begotten Son? Just several weeks ago? When Pilate was determined to let him go, you, you insisted that a murderer be released to you instead of Jesus? You, you remember the events? 
Well, God raised Jesus from the dead. God brought him back. And by faith in his name, and by the power of his name, this man is walking today. Peter gives full credit to Jesus Christ for this man being able to walk. You see, Peter had walked side by side with Jesus for three years. He was a witness to the life that Jesus lived. He was there and was a witness to Jesus' crucifixion. And he was a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He just offered to give this lame man the opportunity to be exhibit A of the power and truth of Jesus Christ. And man, did this guy do it. He gave, he gave all credit to God. He got up, he's jumping, and he's praising God. He's given all the credit to Jesus Christ for what he did. And when the crowd comes up, Peter says, let me let you know. Let me let you know who did it. You killed him. But he came back. Instead of releasing him from the cross, you asked Pilate to give you a murderer, even though Pilate was willing to release him to you. You traded him for a murderer, and you had the only begotten Son of God killed on a cross. That's the guy who healed this man. That's the one. Jesus was no longer physically on the scene. Remember, he ascended back to heaven just a couple weeks before this. But this man was used to show them that he was still among them. Jesus is still among us, and he's still who he says he was. He is God. He was God in the flesh. But then Peter turns the whole event back around to grace. Peter's, like I said, he's learned a lot. He's going to turn the whole thing back around to grace. The shame that this crowd would have been feeling at this moment would have been unbearable. Who healed him? Jesus. Jesus who? the Son of God who you killed. That Jesus. You know what kind of guilt would be sitting on you when you see the power of God evident after this man's off the scene and he's still working through people's lives? The guilt that you'd feel like, oh wow, I, we might have killed God. That, that's a big one. That's a big, big mistake. We might have killed God. The, the guilt that they would feel would be unbearable. So Peter tells them the truth about what happened instead of leaving them in their shame. Remember, they killed Jesus. Look at verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I know that you did it out of ignorance. Yeah, you killed Jesus. But death couldn't keep him down. He came back. And I know what you did. You did it out of ignorance. And so did your rulers. They did it out of ignorance too. Most people are not purposely trying to cause others to go astray when it comes to the things of God. I truly believe that. There are many denominations out there. There are many different religions out there and I believe with all my heart they're not trying to hurt people by teaching false doctrines they're not trying to hurt people by teaching false religions they believe what they believe is true I don't believe that they're trying to harm anybody but the truth is there is only one way there is only one truth and there is only one life and that is Jesus Christ and they're doing it out of their ignorance we can judge people for what they believe or what they teach, but we would be wrong to do that. We need to understand that they're doing it out of ignorance and they need to know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to have compassion on them. No matter what they believe, let's have compassion on them and get the truth to them. The Jewish crowd believed that they were getting rid of a problem which was causing people to believe in a deceiver. They believed Jesus Christ was the deceiver. So they are trying to remove this problem so it didn't affect the people. Peter shows them that they did it in ignorance. But because of that ignorance, prophecy was fulfilled. God used your ignorance to fulfill the prophecy that he said would happen about his son. Yes, you did it in ignorance. But understand the prophecy was fulfilled using your ignorance. But grace is still available. Grace is still available so he tells them the importance of repentance. 
understand, I understand it was ignorance. You did it. But understand also the prophecy was fulfilled because of that. So why don't you repent and be converted? Turn to Christ. Peter didn't have silver and gold. But he offered this lame man what he did have. And by that opportunity, the love and the grace and the power of Jesus Christ was shown to all those people that day. So we took what Peter had. We see what Peter had to offer. We take what Peter has. Now, the only right thing is to go pay Paul. You know how the, it goes. You know, we rob Peter. Now, the next step is to pay Paul. That's, that's what we're supposed to do according to the saying. So let's turn over a few pages to Acts chapter 26 and see what Paul would want us to do. Now we've taken what Peter has. We see what Peter had to offer. We've got that. Lock that down. Now let's go see Paul. At this time, in Acts chapter 26, Paul has been through a series of trials. And I don't mean trials just like hard times. I mean he's been on trial. He was falsely accused by the Jewish rulers. And he's now standing before a government official named Festus. Festus questions Paul. And after questioning Paul, he can't find him guilty of anything. I don't see what he did wrong. So what Festus does is he turns him over to King Agrippa. Now Paul's standing before King Agrippa. King Agrippa was the king over Judea at the time and was extremely knowledgeable about Jewish customs and beliefs. He understands these people that he's ruling over. He understands their customs. He understands what they believe. And Paul was relieved when he heard that he got to stand in front of King Agrippa. I know it's a Judean king, but I am, I am thankful that I get to stand before him. Look at Acts chapter 26 and verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today... I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Paul's about to plead his case before King Agrippa, and, he's, and his case is extremely compelling. And he's glad that he gets to stand before King Agrippa because King Agrippa does understand the teaching of the Jews, he understands the background of the Jews. He understands the customs. And he's grateful that he gets the opportunity to stand before this king. And he starts out by confessing that he was in the wrong. And he tells him of what the Jews were actually charging him for. If you want to win a case, you usually don't confess your downfalls. But that's what Paul does. The first thing I want to tell you is my downfalls. Not a strategic move most of the time, but this was a good move for Paul. Look at verse 5, speaking about the Pharisees and Jews. They knew me from the first, <clears throat> if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. He admits that he used to be just like the people who are accusing him. The strictest sect of our religion. I lived as a Pharisee. That's who I was. Those are the people that are accusing me today. He was a Pharisee who lived to uphold the things of God. Paul had a sincere heart. He was chasing after God. He wanted to, to glorify God with his life, he just did it in his ignorance. He was just doing it in his ignorance. He did everything he could to protect people from what he thought was false teaching. He was one of those people that Peter just referred to in chapter 3. I know you are doing it out of your ignorance. Now we're looking at Paul's story as one of those people who are doing it out of his ignorance. Look at verse 9. Acts 26, verse 9. It says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, 
having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Paul just told King Agrippa that he was now standing in the same circumstance that he used to put Christians in. I would shut them up in prison and they would be facing death. I was that guy. I was the guy that tried to shut down Jesus' story, the teachings of Jesus Christ. I was that guy. But one day on the road to Damascus, Paul was on the way to Damascus one day and God got a hold of his heart and he got saved. And he wanted everyone to have what he had. So he started telling everyone about what God had done for him. Look at verse 20. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Paul says, I used to be one of them. I used to be the Pharisees. Then I saw the truth. So now I've been living my life trying to get the, the truth back to them. And because I was preaching the truth for this reason, they seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. This, King Agrippa, is why I'm standing here today. Paul was just trying to give the good news of Jesus Christ to his fellow man. But the Pharisees were just like he used to be. I used to be like that. And that's why they've, they've thrown me in prison. That's why they're trying to kill me and get me off the scene. I used to be just like them. And when Paul was converted to Christianity, those who refused to believe him sought to kill him. You're a traitor now. You were a Pharisee, now you're a traitor, and they sought to kill him. Now he's standing before King Agrippa, testifying that all he's trying to do is to show Jesus was the fulfillment to every prophecy that the, pro the prophets prophesied about the Messiah. All I'm trying to do is show them that in their ignorance, they put Jesus Christ to death. But because of that ignorance, and because they put Jesus Christ to death, he actually fulfilled every single prophecy about himself. And I'm trying to get the truth back to them to let them know that He is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God who came down to this earth to pay the price for my sins and their sins. And I'm just trying to get the message back to them so they can understand that. But then he makes things very personal for King Agrippa. Paul was really talented at this. He says, all I wanted to do was let him know that the prophecies were fulfilled in this one man, in Jesus Christ, and I want them to know the truth. Then look what he says to King Agrippa in verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then, King, then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Look at what just happened in that courtroom. Do you believe the prophecies? Because I know you do. You're an expert in the customs and beliefs of the Jews. You know, you know what's been taught. You know about all the prophecies. Do you believe it? Because I know you believe it. And then King Agrippa makes a shocking statement. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. A Judean king. Man, I, I want to be like you. How in the world are you persuading me to desire what you have. Standing there in shackles, I'm sitting here on the throne saying, man, I wish I was that guy. How did you do that? You're persuading me. I, I, wanna, I want what you have. As King Agrippa is listening to Paul, he's seeing a vision and a hope that even the nation's kings in all their splendor does not possess. Man, you've got a lot going on for you, Paul. I see a vision in your eyes. I see hope in you. I can see that you have a hope that all the greatest kings on the earth don't possess. And you've got something amazing. Paul is standing before him in chains and seems to be living a better life than he is himself. Wow. You've got something going on there, Paul. 
what do you have that makes me as a king want to be you as a prisoner? What, what is it about you? You almost persuade me to want to be in that scenario. There was a light shining from Paul's life and Agrippa says, you almost, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And that's when Paul tells everyone what he desires. Remember, we robbed Peter. Now we're going over to Paul to see what he would want. So let's look at what he says here. Verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. I wish you could become like me. I wish you could have everything I have, minus the chains. I don't wish this on anybody. But I wish you could not only become almost, but altogether such as I am, except the chains. Paul wanted Agrippa to have everything he had in Christ. He wanted, to see, he wanted Agrippa to see what abundant life was really all about. You think you're living in all that money? You think you're really living with all that power? And yet you're sitting there wishing you were like me. Because what you're seeing in me is an abundant life. And chains can't take that away. So even a king looks at him and says, wow, how is it that me and all my freedom, I can go anywhere I want, I can do anything I want, I can buy anything I want, I have complete freedom, and I'm now sitting here looking at you saying, man, I, was, I wish I was as free as that guy. As you're all chained up, you almost persuade me to want to be like you. What just happened? Paul wanted everyone to be like he was, minus the chains. So now you see what Peter has. And he starts out by saying, a silver and gold? Yeah, I don't have that. I don't have any money. Fisherman. That's no longer fishing. That's not good business. I don't have silver and gold. I don't have money. But what I do have, I want you to have. Then you go over after you get that from Peter and you go over to Paul and say, okay, Paul, what do you want me to do with this? Keep it. Keep it. You don't, uh, you don't give me anything. When you step back and look at the financial situation and the lifestyle situation of both Peter and Paul, there's really nothing to be envious about. They, you're a prisoner and you're broke. Why are we choosing these two guys to rob and pay the other one with? <laughs> these, they both have nothing. Paul was eventually beheaded and Peter was eventually crucified upside down. But they both wanted everyone to have what they had. I want you to have what I have. Robbing Peter to pay Paul would have only left them both in the same situation they were already in. They both forfeited everything so that others could see Christ. They gave it all up so that other people could see Christ. Peter said, what I have, I will give. And Paul said, I wish everyone was as I am. They both had a vision for the lost world to be saved and they introduced Christ by the way that they lived. I want you to know Christ. I want you to see what I have. And they both lived to give people all that they had. They even had a love for the people that were causing them harm. I want to go back to those Pharisees who are, are trying to kill me. I want to go back to them and I want them to have what I have. If you wanted to rob Peter, you didn't have to do it secretly. He wanted you to have it. He wanted you to have what he had. And if you wanted to pay Paul, you would have a hard time doing that because he already had everything he needed. You wouldn't be able to pay Paul. During Paul's ministry, the Philippian church wanted desperately to take care of Paul, but they ran out of resources. They didn't have anything to give him. They, they wanted to take care of him, but they didn't have a way to take care of them. And when they finally had a way to give him something, they did. And Paul told them that he knew that they cared 
They just lacked opportunity to take care of him. I know where your heart was. You just didn't have an opportunity to help me. And I understand that. But look at what he says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, following the understanding that he had about them not being able to help. In verse 11, it says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Paul just told everyone what he had. He said that he could do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Now I want to bring some clarity to this verse. A lot of times you hear this verse taken out of context, and I want to put it within its context here. This doesn't mean that we can call fire down from heaven or walk on water because Christ strengthens us to do so. Don't try those things. If you're going to try one, try calling down fire from heaven. Don't try walking on water. Neither one of them are going to work, but one, you might not die. But it doesn't mean we can do miraculous things just because God strengthens us. So we've got to keep this verse in context. Look at what Paul is referring to when he makes this statement. He says that he can both abound and suffer need. He says that if things are going good or if they're going bad, he can do all things through Christ which, who strengthens him. Whether, whether I'm going through bad times or whether I'm going through good times. If finances are low, if relationships are broken, if health is fading, if riches are flowing in and prosperity is coming my way. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. He knew he could be content because of the strength that he had because of Christ. Even in chains, I'm happy. I, I'm happy. I'm content. Whether I have riches or I have complete poverty and sickness, I'm content because of the strength that I have in Christ. So the question is, where did he find that kind of strength? What is this strength that Christ gives us? Well, Nehemiah tells us what that strength is. Back in the Old Testament, we find out what that strength is. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What did the lame man do as soon as he was healed? He jumped up and praised God. He had joy in the Lord. Credit goes to him. I praise God. What I have now you have. Praise Him. Praise Him. You have joy in the Lord. He was thankful for God's grace. I pray that this year our church will have a 2020 vision to show a godly strength which only can come through the joy of the Lord. My prayer is for everybody in this room to show the joy of the Lord from our life so people can see strength. And by the way, if you go through a situation where you end up scarred, praise Him through that. And in all things, be content. Because you still have Christ. If, you ha if everything's taken away from you, and you're left with food and raiment, food and clothing, that's all you have. You got something on your back and you have a little bit to put in your mouth. You're robbed of everything else. Can you still say, I am completely content because even if I lost those last two things I still have Christ I still have Christ this year we will both abound in some situations and we will suffer need in other situations it's going to happen but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us we can do it and Satan's going to do everything he can this year to bring anxiety in your life he, he, anxiety can stop you in your tracks. Worry. Fear. Satan's going to do everything he can to bring anxiety in your lives. He'll try to discourage you and make you become bitter because of situations. But if our vision is to keep Christ as our focus and find joy in who he is and what he has done, we'll be completely content in both the good times and the bad times. The lame man had joy in the Lord. 
And King Agrippa envied Paul because he had joy in the Lord. I want what you have. You're, you persuade me to want to be like you, a prisoner. What is it that you have? I'm so content. But you're in prison. I'm living the dream. A bad dream? No, it's a great dream. Because his life was given to me. And now I have eternal life, which was Christ's life. And no matter how bad my situation gets, I still have that. And I have joy. My joy is in the Lord. So even my bad situation is not that bad. Both Peter and Paul were advertising something that could only be found in Christ. An abundant life. Christ was enough. If I lost everything else, I still have Christ. And I advertised that. And their desire was to give other people all that they had. So in 2020, I challenge you to live content with everything that you have because of Christ. Even if it's not much, we still have Christ. Understand what you have. And if everything else is lost, Christ remains. And you can have joy in the Lord. I want to close out this sermon with one final word from Peter. Paul's the one that said, in, all, in whatever state I am, I'm content. Why are you content? Because of the strength that Christ gives me. What is that strength? Well, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I, I, I love the fact that I have an overwhelming amount of joy in my life because of what he did. So let's look at what Peter ends up saying. He ends up writing the book of First and Second Peter. Let's look at what he says in First Peter 1.6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Peter says, if even God chooses to allow you to go through bad times where your faith is tested and times get tough and you feel like you need to rob me to pay Paul, even if it gets a rough, the situation gets rough like that, you believe in somebody you've never seen. You believe in Jesus Christ and what he's done for your life. Remember, you believe in somebody you haven't even seen yet, but you love him. You love him. So rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. May our vision for 2020 be to live with a complete joy in the Lord. And when it comes to expressing that joy to other people, give them all you got. Give them all you got. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine from Renew Church in 2020. The problems that come are just scars that make you stronger. So praise God in those times. Let God use those things to strengthen you. Find joy in the Lord in every turn that you make in 2020. And when people want to know what it is about you and your bad situation, why do I want to be like you when your life is so miserable right now? It's because I want you to have all that I have. I want you to have Christ. I want you to have the abundant life. Be the light. Let that be your vision for 2020. And when it comes to the joy of the Lord, showing other people the joy of the Lord, give them all you got. Stand with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word.